So welcome everyone. I wanted to introduce our speaker. I'm Phil Tedesco. I am the CEO of the Rhode Island Association of Realtors and Statewide MLS. So we have folks in the room. I think we had between 30 and 40 registered via Zoom. So we have a number of folks that are joining us remotely. So just a quick rundown, we're gonna have Michael uh, present from 12 to one, and then we'll have lunch for the folks that are here in person. We didn't wanna eat while we were doing it because we knew we had um, a virtual audience. So I am really excited that Michael came up to Rhode Island. Uh, we've known Michael five, six, seven years at this point. All right. We've been interacting at various conferences nationally. Um, Michael has multiple um, developments, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Honduras, yeah. Belize, Belize um, Panama. And what we're going to discuss today is uh, <coughs> international referrals, kind of what, you know, what, what we could be doing more of in this space. So with that, Michael, thank you. Well, well wonderful. Thank you, Phil. It's good to be here. Let me see if I can get the screen share going. How's that? Good. All right. Talking about referrals, so I was very fortunate to be a part of the global committee meeting just uh, from 11 till a few minutes ago. And, and you know, the, the, the idea of a toolkit came up, right? The idea of creating a toolkit and, and uh, uh, Dylan May. So you ask what you could do. Now you know what you can do, right? You can help with that toolkit, right? The, the challenge, I think, for us as domestic realtors Right, is, is really the, the, this question, right? How do we bring value to an outbound global transaction? And you mentioned a couple things that I thought were spot on and brilliant. You said you helped uh, a friend of yours buy a property in France, right? Or your brother or your, uh, somebody. Okay, right. That, that's tremendous because you have done what I think most people stumble with as domestic realtors. How do we help somebody buy a piece of property overseas. What do I know about Portugal? What do I know about Belize? What do I know about Thailand? These are real questions, of course, because not all of us can know very much about, you know, any one of these countries or maybe one of them in particular. So how do we bring value? Well, we can and we do. And we're going to talk about that. But what we're really talking about is a toolkit. And I love that idea, the toolkit. And it's something very, very valuable. And, and what we've done is to help create this toolkit. Back in 2012 or 13, I don't remember now, uh, Jeff Hornberger was with the National Association of Realtors. He brought a CIPS class to Nicaragua. I was living in Nicaragua at the time, and I got to know Jeff. And a couple of years later, Jeff said, Mike, come up to Chicago, you know, be a part of this presidential advisory group and help NAR design an outbound global program. How, how many folks in here are CIPS, by the way? So you got a couple, one, two, two, three, huh? Candidate. candidate. All right. Well, good. Candidates. Good. All right. Well, very good. Right. So it's the certified international property specialist. And if you're going through the course or you've gone through the course, what you know is that it's mostly about how do we help foreigners buy property in the U.S. Right. People are coming to the U.S. to buy property. Ninety plus percent of that course, the CIPS course, is about how do we help those people buy property here? which is great because that's a huge business. What was it, 52 billion last year or something? It was a big chunk of business that was brought into the United States you know, by folks from outside. But what NAR wanted to do and what they asked me to come in and help with was how do we design a toolkit, a program that lets domestic realtors sell abroad, bring value to the outbound transaction? Jacqueline Goose is here. She's, uh, she's uh, in the uh, Boston area. I love the tagline working globally, closing locally, right? So that's her tagline. It's a great tagline. And- It's the name of my business. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. It's the name of your business too. All right, even better. Thank you, Jacqueline. Yeah, okay. Uh, but, but, but I think that sums it up for all of us, right? Because if we're, looking at, if we're looking at international business, global business, we're not going somewhere else to sell a piece of property, are we? No, no, we're doing it here. We're doing it locally, right? But how do we do this global business locally? Yes, a big part of it is inbound. There's this outbound piece too. And that's really what we're gonna talk about today. The program that I helped the National Association create and the toolkit uh, that came with it. Let's see, maybe not. Hmm. 
I might need Robert again. I don't know. We'll see if I can get the slides to click forward. There we go. Okay. Well, that's me. You know me already. Okay. So here's what we're going to talk about today. You know, how do we bring value to this outbound transaction? Why are people buying overseas and who, who is buying property overseas? Due diligence questions. This is where we bring the value. This is where the rubber meets the road. We're going to look at some very specific examples on this. Top locations in the region, and then two quick case studies, Portugal and Belize, so that you can really drill down and see in a granular basis what value you can bring to this transaction. So why will you bring value to the transaction? Well, here's the numbers. The Zogby company surveyed 103,000 people, US citizens. That is a huge statistical sampling. And what they found was 11.6%, so I call that one in 10. One in 10 US citizens is seriously considering property ownership overseas. One in 10. How many folks, I mean, there may be some other types of folks in here. How many folks are actual realtors here? I mean, we have the association executive mortgage people too, okay. And if you've been in the business for any length of time, you've got a client book, you've listed homes, you've sold homes, hopefully you have a network, hopefully you have a database of people that you're in communication with. And if that number runs into the hundreds or thousands, do the math, one out of 10. One out of 10 of the people you already know and probably have served, right, many of you serve, are interested in property overseas, one out of 10. Okay. So how will you bring value? Well, first, we have to take the toolkit, right? It's really three things. We have to identify them. We have to identify them. Because the inverse of one out of 10 is nine out of 10. And nine out of the 10 people that are in your network and you've served could care less about owning a property overseas. They're never going anywhere. Most of them don't even have a passport, right? They're not leaving. They're not vacationing outside the US. So we have to identify the one out of 10, first object. Second object, we have to serve them. We have to bring value to the transaction. And because we're real estate professionals, when we bring value to a transaction, we get paid. That's how we earn our fee for service, right? So those are the three steps. Identification can just simply be this simple. Many, many of the people who utilize this toolkit, all they do is they just, I can't get out of the camera. And all they do is simply put an email signature box. Look at this. This is so simple. Every single email that Myra sends out and several hundred of our realtors send out every single email, it's got her name and her phone number, blah, blah, blah. And then it just has this super soft call to action. If you're looking for property overseas, I can help, right? So, if, you know, the nine out of 10 look at that and go, whatever. And the one out of 10 goes, huh, I didn't know Myra was in, could help me with foreign property. Think about that. How would anybody in your network today know that you could help them with a foreign property? How would they know that? They wouldn't. Why would they assume that? They wouldn't assume that. You help them right here in Providence in Rhode Island. So now all of a sudden we're just planting that seed. Yeah. Oh, she can help me or he can help me. Click. Now you've identified that person. Identification. We also put out all kinds of web banners and links. These are tools. This is a whole toolkit that you can request. Banners. But my favorite, and I'm always curious, how many people in here put out a newsletter? One. Man, you're doubling up. That's why I need the chair. There you go, man. <laughs> all right. I got one more chocolate for a question later. But anyway, good job. Newsletters help us maintain top of the mind presence with our clients. I'm a big advocate of newsletters. By the way, there are companies out there, communication director, right? There are companies out there that will do your newsletter for you. So I don't know, it's 50 bucks a month or something. It's peanuts. Just look for them. They're great. They do a super job. But what we do is we actually provide content to newsletters, right? If you have a newsletter, we'll give you articles about Belize or, or Portugal or what's happening in the global environment or whatever it is, right? Real content articles. And again, this is what begins to let your clients know that yes, you can help them with a foreign piece of real estate, right? This is all the identification piece. And how? Sure. Forgot that part, Robert. Thank you. Yes. 
See, th he trained me three times this morning, and apparently it was one time too few. But anyway, uh, <laughs> all right. Um, right. So now the question is, we've identified them, or better yet, these folks have identified themselves, right? We didn't identify them. They identified themselves. They clicked a banner. They clicked an email box. They read a newsletter, right? They've said, hey, tell me more. Okay, so how do you tell them more? So what you'll see here are products that we provide in our area of expertise, which is Latin America, right? We have country handbooks, right? These are things about, I mean, everything about the country. Just think about like a, a, a tourism guide, right? But it's a little bit on the business side. It has stuff about economics, right? And, and national holidays. And if there are in, internal airlines and bus schedules and things like that, right? Because if somebody's thinking about owning a property overseas, that's the kind of stuff they really care about, right? What's it gonna be like to move there, live there, vacation there, whatever it happens to be. But the one piece of information that you can provide every single person who's thinking about buying a property outside their home country is the one on the left, the consumer resource guide. And we're gonna spend some time talking about that because that is all about due diligence. That is the value you can bring to a transaction no matter where in the world somebody is buying a piece of property outside their home country outside their home country. And then obviously if we, uh, if we serve, right, then we can earn and that's really the, the key. One in 10 folks buying property overseas, one in 10. We work in Latin America, we've been around since 1996. We've been doing this a long time. And I always like to put the next slide up because it, it really drives home a point. How many folks in here would be going to Nicaragua on vacation? Anyone, anyone, one, two, Okay, three, all right, good, good for you guys. Okay, most people look at Nicaragua and they go, no way, I am not going there, all right? And we can all remember for old enough, I remember, you know, the Iran-Contra scandal, the Sandinistas, Ali Nord, right? Danny Ortega, right? All that kind of stuff, right? There were bad days in the 80s. I mean, it was a nasty civil war and a lot of people were killed, right? So we have this hung, hung over. So a lot of people are saying, no, Nicaragua, that's fine. But the next, thing I really want to drive home, and this is a question, look at I get, and people are like, why does he have pizza up there? <laughs> how many, I'm sorry, how many people like anchovies? Couple. All right, how many, and, and but I don't like Hawaiian, I'll use my example, I don't like Hawaiian pizza, I like anchovies, but I don't like Hawaiian pizza. But if, if whoever doesn't like anchovies, if you owned a pizza parlor, would you sell anchovy pizza? Mm -hmm. Right. It's not about what we like, it's about what our clients like. And Nicaragua, for some people, is a great location. It's not, it's not very popular, don't get me wrong, but it is a place that people want to own real estate, right? And these are the reasons people are going. Affordability, affordability, incredible affordability, depending on the country. I lived in Nicaragua for 14 years. It was silly cheap. I mean, holy smokes. I don't know, I mean, just to give you one example, I don't know, how many of y'all shop at Whole Paycheck? I mean, Whole Foods. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. One to, I mean, we had a bag, a coffee sack uh, of, of organic, organic fruits and vegetables delivered to our house every Tuesday morning, a coffee sack, organic fruits and vegetables. And it was $8. Like one tomato at Whole Foods is $8. Right. <laughs> right. Anyway, affordability, quality of life. We got to eat organic. Everything was organic, range free, hormone free, all that kind of stuff. Right. So, and again, silly and expensive. People are moving for vacation, pe vacation properties. People are moving for full-time relocation. And then there's the investment piece. And we don't talk about that in here because we're realtors and we're not licensed, but just understand that some of your clients are seriously looking at property overseas from an investment standpoint, not relocation, right? And the consumer resource guide will help them make those decisions better too. So when we lived in Nicaragua, my wife would have a lady come over and give her a massage in the house, set up a table at the house for $20, right? We had a maid. I mean, sorry, anyone have maids? No, the men usually put up their hands. But anyway, Phil, you didn't raise your hand, no? Um, anyway, no, you know, the thing about a maid was it was no chores. Talk about quality of life. For under $200 a month, we had no chores. None. This is a big, big factor of why people are going overseas. 
And then there's the fun stuff, right? All the stuff we always think about when we think about tropics and living overseas and all the great stuff. This is what's driving our clients. This is what gets our clients really excited, really excited, right? Oh my gosh, I'm gonna come down, I'm gonna dive, I'm gonna snorkel, I'm gonna fish, I'm gonna play golf, I'm gonna do all this wonderful stuff, you know, and, and, and we're just gonna have a great time. And they do have a great time and they're down there on vacation, right? And it is a world of options. And then all of a sudden, boom. <laughs> right. This is the worst disease that anyone can get in the real estate industry. This is the people who have been down in some wonderful place, whatever, you know, they've been diving, snorkeling, kayaking, whatever it is they're doing, they're having the time of their lives and they happen to be walking on down the beach and this, this, uh, this great salesperson, like Joe here, he says, hey, come on inside, I'll buy you dinner if you just sit through this presentation, right? And a couple hours later, they've written a check for a condo. Does anyone buy real estate like that in the United States? No, it's margarita madness. We haven't done due diligence. We haven't thought anything through, right? We've just had the best time of our life. Of course we're having the best time of our life. We're on vacation, we should have the best time of our lives. And we just imagine if we buy this condo, it's gonna be this vacation for the rest of my life. But that's not reality, is it? And this happens and it's sad in, in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, this is sad because the product isn't what they want. They can't afford it. They're not going to use it, whatever. You know, and they end up reselling it or dropping it or whatever, right? Margarita madness. So this is how and why we bring value to the transaction, right? Our clients need us, okay? They need us because we never compare apples and oranges, do we? What do we compare? Come on. Thank you. All right, apples to apples but are all apples the same thing? No, oh. and we know that because we're real estate professionals. We're in this business. We understand that nuance is very important, right? We know what to look for when we're helping a client buy a home, right? Oh yeah, it, it looks like the same house next door, but, but you know what? We need to go check the foundation. We need to see if there's mold over here, right? It's the nuance. All apples aren't the same thing. Three bedroom, two and a half bath, colonial, right? Nuance, really important. And when we bring that expertise, we deserve to earn. And this is where we deliver the value right here. And I have one more slide later that's just right on, but we're going to, if we can help our clients understand that they just simply need to slow down, right? Slow down, make the time, take the time to do real due diligence, engage a real estate professional like us as a buyer's agent to help them sort through these complexities, these nuances of property overseas. We will have earned our value, right? We will have helped our clients. So important, proceed slowly because we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. And the other thing that really hits us hard sometimes is we, you know, we bring assumptions, right? And we have some slides coming up in a few minutes to show you some of these assumptions. We have to forget what we think we know. And if you take those two slides, we don't know what we don't know, and we need to forget what we think we know, the synthesis is the word humility, right? When we're humble, we will listen more and talk less. We'll expand our radar screen to catch things that we might not think because we're going to get rid of some assumptions, right? It's a humble way to approach it. So in 2002, this is my wife, Carol, my daughter, Amanda, she was two. We moved to Nicaragua for what we thought would be just a couple of years, right? Get down there, start our Grand Pacifica community. And uh, it was in, we moved in October and I had a, a, a PC like this, a laptop PC. It was a Dell, like that. This is a Dell. Okay. So it was a Dell. And so I moved to Nicaragua. How many Spanish speakers in the room? I know Jacqueline, you speak a few. few. All right. Well, you'll get the joke before I get there. But anyway, so I moved to Nicaragua and. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so one of our directors of our company was a guy by the name of Ernesto Leal. Ernesto was the chief of staff to the president of Nicaragua, President Bolaños, when I moved there. And Ernesto was getting married between Christmas and New Year's and invited me to his wedding. My wife and daughter went home because they already had plans. And I like, honey, I got to stay here. I got to be at Ernesto's wedding, right? So I go to his wedding 
And I walk in and I am now seated at a 10 top table with the president of Nicaragua. Wow, that, that's pretty cool stuff. Now, over the course of the evening, it's like a three, four hour wedding. It's long. I mean, it's Latin weddings are long. Anyway, people are coming and going, but like I'm actually sitting like three seats away from the president of Nicaragua. We're talking. Blah, 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 blah. The end of the evening, we trade business cards. He gives me his presidential business card, writes his personal email address. This is so cool. Hand him my card. Oh, it's so good. I go, go home, go into the office on Monday. And I think, you know what? I'm going to send him a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. <laughs> Fel yeah, Feliz Navidad. We know the song, right? Merry Christmas. Y Feliz Año Nuevo. But I got the I got the N on my keyboard, just like this one, and and the N doesn't have a squiggle over it. I don't have an N. I mean, what the N is at this point? I just like an N with a squiggle. Who cares? But instead of wishing the President a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, I wish the gentleman a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Anus. <laughs> yes, Monica, that's right. Yes, as, yes. Now, <laughs> yeah. Gracious man, never said a word. Um, it, it, exactly, exactly, exactly. Phil, that's right. But you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. I did not know how important a squiggle over an N was. A squiggle over an N, I mean, whatever, right? So I wasn't humble, right? I came with an assumption, how important it could it be? Okay. The point is, is it, it's a silly story, but it really highlights the point that we don't know what we don't know, and, and they really can be things that will trip us up in very serious ways. And we're going to look at that right now. By the way, we ended up in Nicaragua for 14 years, loved it as a family, had a tremendous time there. Um, and uh, 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 but, but now let's get into the meat of it, right? So this consumer resource guide is the synthesis of 26 years of learning lessons like that one, but other ones that are a lot more serious in the real estate industry. And if with these 15 questions that we have, we're going to cover maybe, I don't know, six or seven of them here today. They really boil down to three easy principles. Buy what you see, own community, and know the developer. If we just keep, if we can help our clients, not us, if we can help our clients keep three simple principles in their mind, they will do far better job of owning real estate, buying real estate anywhere outside their home country. Right? It's not just Latin America, it could be Thailand, it, it could be, it could be even be Europe, right? Because European standards are different than US standards. But for a European, North American standards are different, right? This is buying property outside your home turf, whatever home turf is, right? We know the playing field in our turf, right? But when we go overseas, anywhere, it's different, right? So these three principles, right? So start with easy one, year round access, in the rainy season and the dry season, you know, in the tropics, we have dry season, no rain. We have rainy season, whoo, -hoo, look out Nelly, right? So the question is, do you want that or the other, right? That road, by the way, that's a picture of me getting stuck about 26 years ago or 24 years ago when we bought the property. It was at the end of a horrible dirt road, right? And that was us in rainy season trying to get to the property, right? Right, so yeah. But in the dry season, let me tell you, in the dry season, that road, is it, it's a hard clay road. You can drive 50, 60 miles an hour on it. They grade it, it's nice, zoom. In the rainy season, it's negative one mile an hour if you can find an oxen team to pull you out, okay? In the dry season, that's a dry riverbed. There's no water in that. And in fact, you can kind of see where he's coming down on the, on the left side there where the water can actually get up to and it's impassable, right? So again, here's the trick, right? Either the roads are paved, and by the way, bridges are great if they're bridges, whatever, right? But, but the point is, is the best time to buy property in the tropics to make sure you can get there in the rainy season is to actually buy it in the rainy season. However, that's not when most people go. Most people go in the dry season. Again, little things like that can make a big difference. Infrastructure. Uh, the, the, the second part of it there, how about stormwater management? You know what? Infrastructure is the least sexy thing that anyone ever wants to talk about, right? But this is where assumptions can be really dangerous. It's not that we don't know what we don't know. We're coming with an assumption. Oh yeah, the, the state of Rhode Island made sure that all the infrastructure was, all the engineering, all the stormwater management, all that stuff was taken care of. Of course they did, of course they do. They do it right here in Rhode Island every time, right? But when you go south of the border, Latin America, many parts of the developing world, 
<laughs> not happening, right? Uh, internet's important, obviously, high-speed bandwidth. But, but here's, here's, here's one simple thing we can counsel our clients if they're buying property in the tropics, uh, very specifically. Ask the developer to see a copy of their stormwater engineering plans. Because you know what? I mean, those are nice big pipes. That's expensive stuff, by the way, to build. I can assure you that's very expensive because it's gravity. And sometimes if your land's like this, it's you know six feet deep. And when the land's like this, it's 26 feet deep, right? You're running gravity feed, giant pipes. It's expensive. And then you cover it over. And nobody ever sees it again. Unlike a swimming pool, clubhouse, landscaping, everybody sees that. That's the sizzle. That's the sizzle. Everybody sees that. Developers spend lots of money on that. In Latin America, in the tropics specifically, the, one of the most important things we can encourage our clients to do is simply say, please show me the stormwater engineering documents. I want to see those. Because when it rains, one of two things is going to happen. The water is either going to go where God wants it to go, which might not be good for your house, or it's going to go where it's been engineered. This one, this one has real economic impact, significant economic impact. Water pressure, not so much a significant impact, right? But if we're out riding horses, playing volleyball, swimming in the ocean, don't we want to come home and take a nice shower? I do. This doesn't have a lot of economic impact, but it does have quality of life impact, right? So again, water pressure, something that's really easy to test out, but a lot of people just simply don't do it, right? Easy to test. Medical care, how close? This is, the, this is it, by the way. It's not how many miles it is. It's how long does it take to get there? When we, we're in the developing world, it's not about miles, it's about how long, right? So that's sort of the other changing of thinking. And, you know, uh, you know po, po, let me just back up just for a second. You know, part of this whole exercise with this consumer resource guide and these 15 questions is really a process of changing how we think. Right? We need to change how we think about things. It's not about how many miles away this is. It's how many minutes away something is. Right? That's a thought change. Right? And again, these questions help us change how we think. And, and that's really it. But, but here, any kind of zoning, is there a building requirement? Right? So the question is, do you buy a beautiful home site and somebody builds the Hobbit house next door or sets up a, you know, builds a pink lighthouse that they turn into an after hours disco bar. It opens at 1130 every night and goes till 6 a.m. But wait a minute, and, and, and we're all laughing because we're like, they can't do that. Sure they can, Jacqueline, sure they can. There's no zoning, do whatever they want. They own the dirt. Again, zoning is something very rare and it's usually implemented and enforced by a developer. So we just need to ask for that. We need to understand what that is, right? And the other piece that's harder, to, this never works as a soundbite, ghost towns. A developer comes along and they buy a mile of beach, 5,280 feet, right? And they chop it up into lots that are 100 feet wide, 200 feet deep, half acre lots, right? 20,000 square foot lots on the Pacific Ocean, and they sell them for $150,000, $200,000. And people from California go, holy smokes, I'd pay like $5 million for that. Like, yeah, you sure would. You have it for $150,000. Great, developer puts a road down there, sells 50 of these lots in a mile, puts you know, a bunch of money in his pocket and flies back to the US or Canada where he's from. And this is a ghost town. This is a ghost town. And this, there are ghost towns, literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles of properties throughout Central and South America that have been chopped up into lots and sold and there's not a house in sight. And here's the question, does anybody in this room want to be the first house out on that beach all by themselves. Anyone? Right. Every once in a while, Robinson Crusoe is sitting in the room and, you know, they put their hand up, but, but yeah, Jacqueline. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, but you know what, this, this, this is not a community. See this idea of community, right. is very different community. We're going to talk more about that in a second, right? This will never be a community. Never is a long time decades. I've watched projects in Belize that have been ghost towns for, for almost three decades now, right? Nobody, very few people want to be that first person out there by themselves, right? Community takes real planning, real urban planning. Again, it's forethought. 
It's coming in and saying, hey, we're going to put in sidewalks. We're going to put trees to get shade on the sidewalk so people walk, right? People can meet their neighbors. People can have fun together, right? It's also about creating these places, these third spaces, clubhouses, tennis courts, golf courts. I mean, all of the kinds of things where people can get together and enjoy the company of one another. It's really important. Right. And, and so it, it, like a ghost town has no homes. Right. So to have community, you got to have homes, condos, you got to have addresses. Right. So where somebody can either live or vacation or rent it out because vacationers become part of the community. Right. That's part of it. Right. You got to be able to get there. We talked about that. The creature comforts. People want those. Uh, and then the amenities. Right. And so by creating places that people want to be together, places where they can get together and enjoy the company of one another, we create real community. And community, community is, is special because it's about quality of life. But community is also something economic. If we went around this room right now and we asked every person to say what their definition of community is, right? We'd all probably say it a little differently, but we'd all be kind of trying to talk about the same thing, right? This idea of community, right? We all describe it differently, but it's, it's, it's a concept but it's very subjective. The marketplace objectifies and quantifies this very subjective thing called community in the form of price, in the form of price. When we look at real communities, neighborhoods, you would know them right here in Providence and in Rhode Island. You would know the neighborhoods that people really wanna be a part of because it's a great community. They love the neighbors, they love the kids, whatever it is, right? And those prices tend to start higher and stay higher. And then there are probably other places that aren't communities, right? And you, eh, they do okay, but they're just not the same. Community really has intangible and tangible benefits. And when we go overseas as expats, you know, community becomes really, really, really important for most people. And there are lots of ways to get involved, right? I mean, if you can find people to do you know, beach cleanups and sea turtle and, and pitch in rotary clubs, lion clubs, Kiwanis, faith-based organizations, all of these things, right, are part of it. And so when we're looking for a property overseas, when our clients are looking for a property overseas, right, we need to encourage them to dig in, join the rotary club, join the lions club, right, get involved, do some things outside the, the neighborhood, so to speak, because when you do that, you'll meet other people like yourselves who share that common desire to help and do wonderful things, but you also meet whoever's in the neighborhood too, which is also awesome, right? This, this is how we really build community and a quality of life that's tremendous. All right, homeowners associations, right? The second one's my favorite though, are the fees high enough? We're gonna look at that right now. We come out of a society and a government, right? That really takes care of us, right? I mean, some people refer to it as a nanny state. I might. I, mean, I think we're lulled into a false sense of security when we go overseas because we're moving from a seller beware environment, consumer laws, lemon laws, regulatory agencies, right? It's really hard. It's not, it's not impossible, but it's really hard for businesses to cheat people in the United States, right? We have a few examples, Enron, whatever, they, they stand out because they're just so rare, right? So rare. But when you go to Latin America, the developing world, those laws don't exist. You have moved from seller beware to buyer beware. Wow, wow. Again, we gotta change how we think, right? And, and by the way, it, I, I just uh, interviewed uh, this week, earlier this week, uh, Bitcoin Magazine had me on. And one of the guys, and I asked permission to use it, and I'm gonna use it till it dries up. Uh, he said, you've got to have radical personal responsibility. I said, yeah, you're right. When you decide you want to own property overseas, you need to invoke in your mind radical personal responsibility. And the next few slides drive this home, right? So check out this advertisement. This is a you know, beautiful condo, two bedroom, two bath condos, little pools in a building, elevator, maintenance and security. Read that. The maintenance fee for these lofts is one of the most attractive things. So now you're taking the HOA fee and you're turning it into a sales tool, right? That's one of the most attractive things. Only $350 a year. A year. That's right. I said a year. Now, does anyone in here really believe you can take care of a condo building with security and an elevator and maintenance and insurance? And yeah, right. 
This is just a lie. This is just a lie. It's a lie used to sell condos. That's what it is. Okay. Now, we need to be able to let our clients know that this is the kind of stuff they may face. And so it's really just a simple matter of saying, does that make sense? Again, radical personal responsibility. Help our clients get it so that they look at that and they go, uh-uh, eh, that's a load of BS, which it is. Because then, you know, do the amenities exist? This is kind of buy what you see, right? But by the way, there's a great word in the developer lexicon, gonna. <laughs> We're gonna build a golf course. We're gonna build a clubhouse. We're gonna, right? Well, you know, again, there's no truth in advertising. There's no backup to that, you know, gonna. And I have a slide coming up in a second where we, 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 uh, we attack the gonna statement. Development company financially sound, right? Look, when we buy a property overseas, we absolutely have to think to ourselves, we're getting married to the developer. That's who, it's like a marriage, right? You know, and this whole Margarita Madness, Margarita Madness is meeting somebody in a bar today and getting married tomorrow. That's Margarita Madness, we're getting married tonight. It doesn't happen very often, right? That, that's, but, right? But when we really get married, usually we date some, we meet somebody, we date them for a while, and then, you know, some period of time, months or years, then we get married because we've gotten to know that person and we built that relationship and that trust that they're going to be there, they're going to be around, they're going to take care of things. When we buy a piece of property overseas, the government of whatever country that is, is not going to take care of you. The relationship is between you and the developer. Critically important. Yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, that one came out of Nicaragua. That one. I'm sorry. The question was what, I'm sorry. The question was what country did the, did the condo maintenance fee come out of 350 a year? Yeah, it was Nicaragua. Go ahead. So I was just talking about where I come from. So it's actually a supplier number. That's why they were trying to come fit. Yeah, 350 a year. Yeah, so 350 months are like 12, so the rate is one high. So 350 every month. Oh, every month? Yeah. Yes, every month. Yes, correct. Every month. No, you said 350 by 12. You know, yeah. So yeah, yeah. So right. My currency is four thousand two hundred. Okay. So that's the correct amount of the numbers. And then all right. Okay, maintenance for that is actually the right number. Three fifty. So it used to be two fifty, for example, at home. I'll have somebody just pull me out. Right. Two fifty. Two hundred. So now the rate is three fifty. So it is correct. Okay. And it's it's how everything is known. Yeah. So and and you know what? It, it really can be any number, right? It could be any number, but we the consumer must do the math. Yeah. We need to do the math to make sure that it adds up in our heads, right? So it could, it really, it, you're right. Any number could be the right number, but it's on us as the consumer in a buyer beware environment to do the math and make sure it adds up. But thank you. Yeah. So remember this commercial? Yeah. Some of y'all, yeah. where's the beef, right? Where's the beef? But this is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is where we have to change our thinking, right? Gonna. The developer says, I'm gonna build a golf course. Okay, that's four or five million bucks. No problem. Show me the money. We're, what, what month is this? May? Print me April's bank statement and show me, right here, five million bucks sitting there. Then I believe you. You're gonna build a golf course. You've got five million dollars in the bank. Do it, right? Show me the money. North American consumers feel shy, maybe. I'm not sure. Or it'd be insulting. Like, what do you don't believe me? No, I really don't believe you. Show me the money, right? It's okay to say that because nobody's looking out for you but you, right? This is again how we have to change how we think. <laughs> ask for financials, right? We provide them. We provide them to all our clients who ask, right? Every last one of them. How about a track record, right? How about a team? How about a business plan, right? These are just normal things in the US. You don't start a business without a business plan. Like, you can't build condos and developments without a team, right? But that's not necessarily the case overseas, right? So we've been around a long time. We've got a great track record, but we do it all through the region. We have an incredible leadership team. Leadership is critical. So if you're looking at owning a property overseas, make sure you meet not just person A, but find out the depth behind that person, the developer or, or the salesperson. Have them walk you around. Who is in the organization that's going to take care of stuff? And then start counting heads. 
oh yeah, there's like four people out here. Oh no, no, there's 34 people. Okay, now, I mean, it depends on what it is, right? But you need to, again, be understanding that it takes real people to put boots on the ground and do things. And it's our responsibility to understand that. So I have one more example. And I hope if there's any doubt in anyone's mind that they can bring value to this outbound transaction, the next slide will absolutely clear it up for you. Okay, my favorite slide, because it's the most visual. This is question number four in the consumer resource guide. <laughs> is the home or condominium plumbed for hot water in all the bathrooms? Now, I think all of us are gonna go, uh, uh, duh, yeah, of course it is. So this condo is in Costa Rica, million dollar view, beautiful, three bedroom, three and a half bath, phenomenal condo, really beautiful, beautiful condo. Bathrooms are very nice. I don't remember if it was American or Delta, nice faucets, the lighting over the mirror was great, right? All right, we got one guy that gets it already, yeah, okay. Now, when you went in, the master bathroom was good. The master bedroom match with the other two off suites, right? The two other suites. If you walked into that bathroom and you turned on the tap on the right, you'd get water out of it, right? And you turn the tap on the left, which is hot water, of course, you get water out of it, right? But if you look underneath the sink and we don't know what we don't know, so we have to get rid of the assumption, of course it has hot water. And then we have to know that we gotta get down on our hands and knees and we gotta look under the sink. I mean, like, who does that? It's a Y splitter coming out of the wall to run cold water up to both of the taps. So that if you stood there and you turned them both on, water would come out of both of them, either of them, but it's cold water. And so is the shower in two of the three. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, you didn't care so much about that. You didn't care much about the sink, but when I, you know, the showers, get right. Okay, so the question that I think we as real estate professionals have to ask ourselves is would our client want to know before they wrote a check for $400,000 that two of the three bathrooms in that beautiful million dollar view condo were cold water only? If you believe that your clients would want to know that, then you absolutely know you bring value to the outbound transaction, right? You do, we do, we do. I hope everybody has requested, just write realtor at ecidevelopment.com get a copy of the consumer resource guide. Please request a copy of it. Understand what's in it. I believe then you will absolutely see in, in very crystal clear clarity that you bring value to this transaction and you can serve your clients in ways that they need to be served. And then with that out of the way, we can actually get to the fun part. Yeah, the margarita madness part, right? Having fun. Owning real estate overseas is fun. It's delightful. I've been doing it for a long time. It's great. I know a lot of people have done it very successfully, right? It's tremendous. There is a world of options. I mean, look at these different geographies just in, in Latin America. You've got vineyards in Argentina and Chile. Think Denver with vineyards, right? I mean, it's spectacular. So, and by, by the way, if you go to the bottom middle picture, right, that, that's sort of, you know, tip, typical Caribbean kind of thing. That's what a lot of people think of when they think of the tropics, right? They think of, oh, that white sand beach and the palm trees and the blue 16 shades of blue water and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, 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 that's a big part of the tropics. But if you go to the upper right, it's an old colonial city, about a 500 year old city in Ecuador called Cuenca. And it's what I like to call springtime all the time. It's 65 degrees at night and 75 degrees in the day, every day of the year. It is springtime all the time. And it's a beautiful old colonial city with two symphony orchestras. It's a spectacular location. About 5,000 uh, expats live there in a city of about 500,000. About 1% of the population is expat, right? Now, if you said, you know, that's really cool, but I'm not so much an old city person. I like modern new cities. Medellin, Colombia. Medellin, Colombia, a wonderful modern city, right? In the tropical highlands. Again, you can kind of mix and match. How about Cabo San Lucas? Some people said, oh, I love Phoenix but I really like the beach. You can have Phoenix at the beach at Cabo San Lucas. You have desert at the beach. 
right? And you can really, and if you said, hey, I want an old colonial city that's a little more, more like Miami, a little more, you know, not so dry, Cartagena, Colombia, or a modern city at the, in that kind of environment, Panama City, right? So you can mix and match almost all of these different geographies and urban and rural and, right? to really create the perfect location. And what, these, what the Consumer Resource Guide does, it's got some expanded sections beyond the 15 questions, is we help people move into this thought process of what kind of weather do I like? Do I wanna live in a city? Uh, I wanna live in an old city or a new city, right? Do I live at the beach? Do I wanna live on the Caribbean? Do I wanna live in the Atlantic? Or do I wanna live on the Pacific? Because beach is like a lot of different things, right? Again, this whole idea of all apples aren't the same. And so when we can give our clients these kinds of resources to be able to start this analysis process, they can really zero in on what's really perfect for them. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? <laughs> coming, coming, August. Yeah. All right. So this idea of, uh, uh, of, of lots of geographies, lots of ways to mix and match it. And people are buying property all over the world. It's not just Latin America, really. In fact, one of the toolkits, I think, I can't remember, somebody was saying it uh, earlier was, you know, how do we make it? It was you. That's right. How do we make a good referral? How can we be sure that when we make a referral, it's a good one? NAR publishes a list of all CIPS agents around the world, certified international property specialist in whatever, 75 countries around the world. And you know what? I'm, I'm pretty comfortable making a referral to a CIPS agent in France, in Argentina, in Thailand, in Korea, because you know what? They've gone through a process. They have agreed to abide by the National Association's Code of Ethics. That's important. So when we're making those outbound referrals, I highly suggest that CIPS network because you really highest degree of probability you're going to make a referral to somebody who will take great care of your client. And that's really what we want. So let's talk about two quick case studies. I get it. We're going to talk about Portugal for a minute. I'm an island girl, so that's an entirely different thing. Well, it's, it, it, it's coming. It's coming. So why Portugal? Um, I, I, obviously, one of the things that's been driving a lot of uh, immigration to Portugal recently is this golden visa. It's gotten a lot of people excited because it's a very easy way to get European Union residency that leads to citizenship, right? 350,000 euros, so it's, it's somewhat affordable, I guess. Um, and, um, but but it, once you have it, you can live and work anywhere, right, in, in the EU, right? And it leads to citizenship, which again is something very, very important to a lot of people. And this is uh, Sintra, one of the, I think one of the most beautiful castles in, in yeah, it's, yeah, right, in, in Europe, one of the, the most beautiful. Um, but we're gonna go to the islands here. We're going to go to the Azores. I, you know. <laughs> so a lot of people are like, where are the Azores? All right. Oh, anyway, there they are. That little red dot uh, out, out on two thirds of the way across to, uh, uh, to Portugal. And it's a uh, beautiful little island, San Miguel. Uh, right here from... Oh, you are too? Yes. All right. Well, it's just a couple pictures. I mean, people don't really understand how beautiful and how green it is. It is spectacular, right? These are some, just some great photos. Look it up and get, go visit. I mean, it's even better to go visit sometime. Anyway, but it's, it's, it's an island in Hawaii and a child. May I borrow that? I, thank you. I'm going to borrow that. That's good. Uh, Ireland and Hawaii had a, a baby. Okay, and I'm going to repeat it for everybody out in, in Zoom land. Okay, tell me your name. Sedalia. Sedalia said that uh, that the Azores are like Hawaii and Ireland having a baby. Yeah. I think that's a great description. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just look at it. It's spectacular. And then obviously just beautiful heritage. The, the, the cities are old and wonderful and beautiful. Uh, and the culture is tremendous. In fact, uh, you'll appreciate this. This is the uh, Cavajados, and I have been invited to ride in it this June. Yes, so, so uh, no. <laughs> so I, I will be, I, the next year's picture will have me in it. So I'll be there. Uh, I'm excited about this. This is so exciting. But we're, we're working on a project there. So we were able to find a villa uh, that has uh, been lovingly restored. It was started in, in uh, 1697, finished in 1850. It's been operating as a bed and breakfast for about 30 years by a German couple. They're retiring. Uh, 
Uh, we have uh, maybe this week are acquiring the property. It's all going through the lawyers and that takes forever, but uh, any lawyers in here? Oh, sorry. Monica, yeah, never mind. Anyway, <laughs> so, anyway, uh, but but we should have this under acquisition, and uh, yeah, that's right. Anyway, so th there are incredible opportunities, and, and let me just say, I'm not going to talk about the price, but let me just say that the price of this property was so in incre incredibly affordable, right? And homes, single family homes. So somebody, one of your clients, looking to live. You know, in in the baby of Hawaii and Ireland, I really like that. Uh, you know, living on a beautiful island uh, is it's very very affordable. And the other thing is because Portugal wants people to stay in the Azores and not leave, like you two did. Um, sorry, I'm picking on you now. Uh, they they do a great job of subsidizing uh, food and fuel costs, uh, and so things are actually less expensive in the Azores than they are in Portugal. And I had, if I may, so my parents Please. still own uh, eight parcels of land. However, they sold all the waterfront land because uh, with the salt, it wasn't really conducive for, uh, you know, uh, agriculture. And I recall I returned to the Azores for a year when I was 20, a lot of Swedes and Germans, you know, backpacking through Europe. Oh, I can buy waterfront property for next to nothing and built these mansions with tall walls. And it's incredible because they they knew the value early on before we did, right? Yeah. So no, it's an incredible place to, to live and visit. Um, it is. So. Well, we're excited to be uh, doing business yeah. there now. So yeah. Um, and then I just want to do a quick case study on Belize as well. This is this has been uh, for us our our heartland. We started there uh, 26 years ago and have been working there ever since. Uh, and 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 one of the things that again that that's important. Again, we're not going to talk about investment. But I think one of the things that's, that's critically important for our clients who are thinking about investment is to understand where a country is on a development curve, right? Or as I like to call the popularity curve, right? So when you look at this, th this is simply, I said to myself, as I put the different countries on here, I said, if somebody got married here in Providence, Rhode Island tomorrow or Saturday, where are they going on their honeymoon next week? Right? Where are they going on their honeymoon? Cancun? Lots of them, right? El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, not many of them, right? And Belize, somewhere in the middle. This is important because our investors need to understand that while they might love, say, Nicaragua, right? They just personally love it, right? That'd be kind of like putting some kind of crazy stuff on the pizza that not very many people would want to buy at the pizza parlor, right? So we, we, need, to, we need to help folks understand that. And, and, and there's a real correlation between cash flow and price. And, and the more popular someplace is, the more expensive it is. The less popular, the lower the price. For long-term investors saying, hey, I'm looking for, I'd like to buy it very inexpensive. I'm willing to ride it out for 5, 10, 15 years. I want to get that big capital gain. Right. You want to be down at the low end of the popularity. Somebody says, I want immediate cash flow. I want high occupancy, great ADR. You're going to pay more for it. You're going to buy a condo in Cancun, right? But you're going to get immediate occupancy and ADR. So again, just this sort of, and there's, a, there's about a two-page article about this particular slide in the Consumer Resource Guide that helps our clients begin to think about this particular element of property ownership as an investment. Uh, Belize is kind of in the middle, a great airlift from the US, Central and South America and Canada. English is the common law. English is the official language, sorry, and common law is the law of the land. Very, very familiar to North Americans very familiar uh, common law english obviously familiar as well <laughs> no enyes in english um, yeah uh, great, great yeah all right yeah uh, and great residency programs a lot of folks uh, looking to live overseas pick up a second residency i call it the plan b right for a variety of reasons uh, our business uh, went up fivefold from 2019 our business grew fivefold in two years. And I'm going to venture a guess that two thirds to three quarters of those folks were plan B buyers, remote workers, right? Digital nomads who said, you know what? I can live in Belize, Nicaragua. You know, I can move overseas and I can do my job from somewhere else. But a lot of them just said simply, you know what? I'm going to buy a home overseas in case I want to go there someday. Plan B, right? And uh, th there are a lot of folks out there thinking of that. So residency programs are really important for that aspect. Um, Belize, strong economy, growing tourism. Uh, just it's been ranked by TripAdvisor 
Uh, obviously, you can see the fall off in 2020, COVID, whatever, right? Things fell off, but, but again, climbing back up again. Um, and, and Belize is an incredible country. It's, it's very small. It's 180 miles north to south, about 80 miles wide, but it's got reefs, it's got uh, jungles, it's got cave tubing. Well, actually, one of the top 10 coolest things I've ever done in my life is float through caves on an inner tube. <laughs> if you ever go to Belize, I know Phil, you're headed there. Uh, make sure you go cave tubing. Oh my gosh, floating through caves on an inner tube. So cool. Uh, Mayan ruins, jungle, great activities. Uh, and then you get out to the island, tons of, uh, just tons of character and, and wonderful uh, people and activities out on Ambergris Key. Again, it's, 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 a, it's a Caribbean destination. So, uh, uh, and, and then for our investors, Again, this is really important, and, and we, we, we talk a little bit about it in our consumer resource guide. This goes to the, no, lo, uh, the, the notion of location, 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 right? right? Belize is, that's a lot of times people think Belize, but again, we're going to thin slice it, right? Well, what is Belize? Well, it's a country this big, 180 by 80. But if you look and see where the tourism revenue, again, for investors, like you might say, look, if it's a light, there are two different things. I'm running out of time and I'm going to wrap it up real quick because I know people are getting hungry. But, but there are two types of decisions that we make as property buyers. We make a lifestyle decision, which is a heart decision. Do I like it? Do I like my neighbors, my neighborhood? Is it close enough to the grocery store or the bank or whatever, the school, right? Versus an investment decision, which is a head decision. Does it cash flow? What are the terms and conditions? You know, more rational, right? Two very different types of decisions. And if our clients understand that they want to live in Belize because they want to live in Belize, well, then the whole country is their oyster, right? They live in the jungle. They can live, with, you know. But if somebody is an investor buyer, right, they need to pay attention to where most of the tourism revenue, most of the occupancy, right? 70% of all the tourism revenue comes from that little island off the coast called Ambergris Key. 26 miles long, a couple miles wide. Almost all tourism revenue for the country. People are going to Belize for low taxes, rental income opportunities. We actually have a Best Western franchise. This, this capitalizes on this notion of in the middle, right? A country is becoming more and more popular. What happens when a country becomes popular? You move from niche, like the Mike Cobb Hotel. Nobody went, I mean, back in the day when I went there 26 years ago, we had the Mike Cobb Hotel. It's called the Exotic Key Beach Resort, right? No, no brand, no nothing. And people who came, they were either serious fishermen or serious divers. There were almost no women and um, very few women and almost no children. It was mostly a diving and fishing destination. And they didn't care where they stayed. Oh, great, Exotic Key Beach Resort, we'll stay there. Right, but as the country becomes more popular, moves up this popularity curve, all of a sudden you get mainstream travelers. Right, you get people who go, "I'm going to Belize," but you know what? I don't know if I really want to stay in something I never heard of before. Right, and so for the for the cost conscious traveler, a Best Western product is branded. We picked up the franchise. We're we're open. We're doing it. It's great. And for somebody who wants to own one, here's a price point: one hundred and thirty thousand dollars for an ocean uh, uh, off the ocean, three blocks off the ocean property in Belize on Ambergris Key, $130,000. Right, price point, right? Just right there. And we also have the Marriott franchise. It's under development right now. Uh, we are, by the way, we, our company is keeping at least 60% of the residences. We're only offering up to 40% for sale. Here's a question that again, we need to, if, again, changing our thinking. If I was standing here and I said, hey, and, and I would never do this anyway, but just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm now the Joe, Joe salesman in Belize. Hey, buy my Marriott condo. It's going to be awesome. You're going to make 13, 14% cash on cash net to your bank account in the rental, in the rental program, right? And here's all the performers and I print them out blah, 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 and I hand them out, right? Okay. I wouldn't believe it, but, but maybe it's true. I mean, maybe it's true. But the question I would ask that developer is simply this. Wow, 13, 14%? That's awesome. How many are you keeping? <laughs> what a simple question to ask, right? If we can help our clients think differently, like, oh, it's a great return. How many are you keeping, right? So we're, we're, we keep a lot of our own inventory because we believe in it, right? But that's a question again on this helping our clients, right? 
so we're under development. Uh, we're, we've broke ground. We're we're uh, about to move people out. But here, oceanfront residences in a Marriott property, three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Again, the affordability of, of the developing world is there. So again, we work all over, not just those places, but I like the case studies because I think they drive home a, uh, an important point about what's there, how it works, and what the value propositions are. We do have trade missions. I heard you talk about those if you're interested. And if you'd like to get the toolkit, right, the web banners, the email signature box, right, Again, Shanae, who's on this call with us, right? That's what she does. She works with all of our affiliates. I think we have about seven, 800 affiliate, realtor affiliates now um, who utilize this toolkit, whether it's just simply the email. By the way, that email signature thing is push and forget. It's the easy button. Take 15 minutes with Shanae and set it up. Every single email you send out now is set up, right? And you can literally do nothing else. It is simply that easy. If you say, I want to be a little more active, I want to put up some web banners on Facebook, I want to publish a newsletter, I want to put some articles, I want to engage it, we have the tools to help you do that too. Uh, the program costs nothing. And here's the really cool thing. Of, of the you know, millions of transactions that have, are occurring around the world, right? There are about eight, by the way, there are 8 million US and Canadians that live outside the US right now. 8 million real estate transactions of people who live outside the US, right, and Canada. Right, our company is going to get a very tiny percentage of that. I get it, 0.001 percent of it. Right, we built this program to be generic. The toolkit, I can help. If you're looking for property overseas, I can help. See, when somebody clicks that, if they say, "I like Belize," here's my here's my request. If somebody says, "I like that tropical palm tree," you know, blah blah blah. Belize, great. Please. Let us have a chance at that business, please. Yeah, at least let us have a shot at it. But on the other hand, they go, you know what? I've always wanted an apartment in Paris. No problem. Now you know who they are. They've identified themselves. They've told you or they've told us and we'll tell you. Now you can get on the phone to that CIPS agent in Paris, France and go, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson have been a great client of mine for many years. They want a home in Paris. Will you please help them? and you work out a, a fee arrangement with that CIPS agent, we get nothing from it. Our company gets nothing from it, right? Except the most important thing, which is your client becomes a very, very happy property owner overseas and writes all their friends about what a great experience it was, uh, puts it on Facebook and tells wonderful stories. And that helps everybody, including us. So the toolkit's there, it's generic, it's free. We'd love to have you involved. Uh, that's how you get a hold of us. And I'm done, Phil. I have, I have a quick question in terms of financing, because obviously we are the, we want to be the resource yes. to the source, right? Um, and these countries all deal differently. Uh, do you at least have a conversation about like, does one finance locally or abroad? Because not everybody's going to be a tax buyer. If, sure. Do you have any of those conversations? That you, you, yes. So the question is, uh, for buyers looking overseas, what are the finance options? Let me shorten it up. Yeah. Um, the, the answer is there's not a lot of financing overseas. There's not. I mean, in, in Europe, there is. And, and even in Mexico, there's some. But you get outside of Europe, Mexico, Canada, uh, the, the financing opportunities really dry up. Uh, and full disclosure, my very first business almost uh, 29 years ago now in Belize was setting up a mortgage company to address that exact issue. How does somebody in the United States who wants to buy a condo in Belize get financing? Because the banks up here aren't lending and the banks down there weren't lending, right? So we did set up a mortgage company. It's still an existing concern. Um, the, 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 but the actual best way for somebody to get financing today anyway, is to, uh, at the best interest rates, is to pull money out of a property in the US or, or their home country, take that money and put it as a down payment. A lot of developers will finance, right? And it's a great question the consumer should ask, right? Mr. Developer, Mrs. Developer, you know, can, can, how much can I put down? Will you take back a, a loan, right, or a note? Um, but that tends to be a big challenge. The, the thing, that, the, the thing that, that we've seen is that because it's a challenge and it's kind of well known for people who are looking for property overseas, most people who are considering property ownership overseas have mentally already said to themselves, it's going to be a cash transaction. 
And so they kind of come prepared for that, but not in all cases, and certainly not as more and more people start to look at this as an opportunity, right? Then it becomes more broad and more general. People assume that they can get loans, but there are a few options. Best option is to take money from something local and, and use it there. And you were recently on a cryptocurrency uh, webinar, weren't you? I was. Okay. I was on a cryptocurrency yes. webinar, yeah. Yes. Any tidbits that you want to share with our fellow Rhode Islanders? Well, I, I think oh. Phil's going to have me come back oh. and talk about that. Sorry, so stay, stay tuned. We'll, we'll, yeah, stay tuned. We'll do that. Okay. Um, but, I have, oh, I have a please. What about the legal uh, differentiation between the different countries as far as ownership? Yeah. That Absolutely. You know, part of due diligence is hiring, and it's in the consumer resource guide. We only touched about half the questions. Um, but, but yes, you, you need to hire your own lawyer. Never use the developer's lawyer, the realtor's lawyer. Hire your own lawyer, right? Always, right? Um, and, and, and generally in Latin America, there's, it's almost all civil law, right? Belize, a couple other Car Caribbean countries can be common law. Again, familiar to us. Civil law is very different. Civil law is foreign in, in many ways, right? Um, but, but legal title, escritura publica, public title in Mexico, by the way, I'll give this qualification, in Mexico along the coast, along the border, which is coastlines and stuff, you have to get what's called a fideicomiso, fideicomiso, and it's a bank trust. But it's, it's a legal mechanism that's not title, and it's officially and formally recognized by the government of Mexico right? And mortgage companies and title insurance companies. Fida Camiso is not title, but it's, I, well, I'm, on, I'm on record saying this, it's as good as title. <laughs> I'll just say that. I believe, how's that? I believe it's as good as title, right? We don't work in Mexico, so I don't have any dog in that fight, right? But, but truly, Fida Camiso in Mexico, time-tested, just as good as title. There are some other titles, rights of possession, like in Panama and other places, where they're not title, they pass them off. Rights of possession, title. They like that last word on the end of it. Just, it's not right. Escritura publica, right? And then the other one that we need to look for in a civil law society, which is similar to strata title, like we have strata title for condos, right? In civil law, that's what's called horizontal property regime, right? It's the civil law equivalent equivalent of of strata title. So again, these are the kinds of things that are fleshed out in the consumer resource guide that consumers absolutely will be able to look at and, and understand. But, but the most important thing, get your own lawyer. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Phil. All right. Thank you, guys.